the 2021 BBC Proms right now. Just search for Proms on BBC Sounds. This is After Dark on BBC Radio 3. Now here's Matthew Sweet with tonight's Free Thinking. We have our work cut out on this edition of Free Thinking. It's the work of a gentleman's gentleman. A bit of Beaujolais pouring, some general looking after, fetching plain brown ale. But I won't be asking our guests to do it. They'll be observing it in a classic of the British screen, one of the darkest, full of rage and desire and envy, one with dirty surfaces. It's The Servant, released in 1963, directed by Joseph Losey, written by... By Harold Pinter from a novella by Robin Maugham and starring one of cinema's most sourly charismatic actors, Dirk Bogard. This is his centenary year, which is why The Servant is back in cinemas and the British Film Institute has programmed a season of his films, showcasing his radically uneasy talent. The plot of The Servant doesn't so much unfold as descend. At the beginning of the story, Tony, played by James Fox, is a slightly bloodless young man with a big house in Chelsea and a girlfriend, Susan, played by Wendy Craig. But he needs help. You've had experience of this kind of work, have you? I've been in service for the last 13 years, sir. The last few years I acted as a personal manservant to various members of the peerage. Oh, I was with uh, Viscount Barr until about five weeks ago. Oh, Lord Barr? My father knew him well. They died within a week of each other, as a matter of fact. So you're free? Yes, I am, sir. Do you like the work? Oh, I do. I, I do. I like it very much, sir. Can you cook? Well, it's, uh, if I might put it this way, sir, cooking is something in which I take a great deal of pride. Any dish in particular? Well, my, uh, my souffles have always received a great deal of praise in the past. Dirk Bogard's Barrett, arriving to cook Tony's lunches, run his baths, take control of his home, banish his girlfriend and dismantle his entire personality in The Servant, an inexhaustibly rich and strange film. So I've got some help in, the best, really. Mark Ravenhill, playwright and co-artistic director of the King's Head Theatre, he's here. Fung Lei, film critic and sight and sound columnist, she's on a line from Paris, which is glamorous. Josephine Botting, curator of fiction at the BFI. She's here to share the treasures of the archive and let joy be unconfined, one of Britain's best-loved actors and one of the stars of The Servant is here. It's Wendy Craig. So, welcome everybody. Make yourselves comfortable, but perhaps not too comfortable. In fact, why don't we start, uh, before discussing the film and how it was made, just the kinds of unease that it produces in us. Mark, when you watch the film, what does it do to you in that regard? I think, just like have it on that, in, in your introduction, you didn't mention funny. And I went last week to a screening and laugh out loud funny. And even just from that extract that we heard, you know, Pinter's got that facility that goes right back to restoration comedy or something. Every line is sort of arched and placed and, and in a big cinema, unsettling funny. But I think we never quite know what's going on. Who's telling the truth? Sister or, or a lover? Is incest going on? Who's desiring who? It doesn't answer all, the, all those questions. So it opens this uh, Pandora's box of polymorphous perversity that is funny and troubling and unsettling. Joe Botting. Yeah, for me, it's it's about this. You know, the, the, the action takes place behind the, the beautiful facade of this Georgian house, but what secrets and, and dark goings on lie behind that facade? The square where it's it's situated is between Thomas Crapper and the beautiful mm. Christopher Wren church at the other side. So it's kind of this coming together of this, this sort of effluence of society. What's happening? There's a lot of scenes of doors, things happening behind closed doors. And as Mark said, we don't really know who anybody is. There's very little background or motivation. So it's very unsettling in that sense. But also the interior of the house is almost very confusing and befuddling. You sort of don't know where 
how you get into a room, the doors are concealed behind bookcases. It's all very, I think everything is designed to make you uneasy. Uh, the weather also, you know, there's no sunshine. <laughs> Foglay, what about you? Does it inspire unease? Does it make you laugh? Absolutely both, because um, I absolutely agree with Mark. It has a kind of campiness to it that's very entertaining, but it's also exactly what I seek in watching movies. I very much enjoy the kind of pleasurable sickness that is had. It feels like a disease of a film, and it's exactly the kind of movie that you want to take the cold shower afterwards, which I really love. Wendy, when you, you obviously you're one of the protagonists in this picture, can you stand back from it and respond to it as a as an audience member? No, absolutely not. I was too close to it. You were talking about the house, how you didn't know your way around the house. I knew my way around the house because I was working on that set. So it's very difficult for me to separate myself from actually seeing it again and not be the actress waiting to go on and say her lines. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to be very helpful there. <laughs> All I know was it wasn't particularly funny. But that could have been the way we worked. It was actually quite heavy going and quite depressing. We'll come and explore that uh, a bit more deeply in a moment. First, I think we need to set up the story and also the talents involved. We heard in that clip at the beginning, Barrett, uh, this manservant, this butler, entering the house. He's walked down Royal Avenue in Chelsea, as you described, uh, Joe, just off the King's Road. Bogard, for years, has been this suave star of, of films for the rank organisation. Joe, can you describe the image that the servant works again that's in his recent past? Well, obviously, he had worked with Losi before uh, on a film called The Sleeping Tiger, which was, uh, again, a very brooding, menacing kind of character who, again, sort of infiltrates a household in, in quite, a, quite a different way. But how do audience, most audiences think of him? Well, he, he was a rank, big rank star. He was under contract. Um, I mean, he could have been an incredible theatre actor, really, but he, he took a rank contract and who can blame him uh, after the war? So he was very much promoted as, uh, as a matinee idol and that's not an image, I think, that he, he enjoyed at all and he wanted much more out of his film career and he wanted to be challenged and he wanted to work with directors who, who challenged him and, and got the best out of him. So he's an actor, Mark, who for the previous decade, um, you know, a, a mass audience is associated with, in a way, light comedy, this sort of thing. He's got this kind of suave image. What kind of figure does he cut as he enters the frame in The Servant? I mean, he's definitely very handsome, isn't he? But um, in the novella that it's based on it, it says there's something also funny about him, threat threatening but funny. And, and one of the decisions that's made by the production is to place his character from, from the north, which there's no indication of in, in the novella. And it is that moment in British culture where you're starting to get the, this sporting lives and northerners arriving in London. That thing is, is put into the mix. The incredible um, archness and, and and campness with menace and brutality. I mean, I think that's something that Pinter brings as well. Pinter's got that great way of placing a line that it could be said by an East End thug or it could be said by a rather bitter old queen in a pub late at, late at night. And I think Pinter brings that with the writing and, and Bogart gets the maximum quality out of that, that very cusp of, of brutal and camp. Wendy, in, in 1962, when you when you shot this film, The Cold Winter of 62, you'd already worked with, with Bogard on a film called The Mind Benders, in which you had a, a smallish part. But what was your what was your sense of where he was in his career? Did did you kind of want a piece of the action of, of this this new way of, of making films? Did you sense he wanted to turn his back on on the rank days, the doctor days? I knew that Dirk was branching out. He wanted to you know, push on to a different kind of style of acting and be regarded with um, more respect, really. I suppose that's what he wanted. When I was asked to do it, I thought, oh, gosh, they've asked me to be part of this. And I'd always thought of myself as really something, somebody quite light and, uh, you know, frivolous. 
Um, and I thought, oh, this is an exciting opportunity to do something entirely different. So, yes, it, it was thrilling to be part of it. And I'd heard about Joe, and I knew that Joe was highly respected as a director. And I thought to be working with Dirk in his new clothes and Joe Losey, what more could one what more could an actress ask? Let's bring Joe Losey into the picture here, um, Joe Botting. Um, as you mentioned, he'd already worked with, with him on a film called The Sleeping Tiger, which bears some, you know, there are some similarities of plot between these two pictures, um, aren't there? But uh, The Sleeping Tiger wouldn't have been known as a previous collaboration between these two talents, would it? Because of what was happening in Losey's life in the 50s. So tell us why that's a strange kind of secret that the film carries. Yeah, so uh, Losey arrived in the UK in January 1953, um, and he had to leave America because his career had, had completely was in tatters, basically because he'd been named by two witnesses at the House Un-American Activities Committee. All his work had dried up. He wasn't getting radio, theatre, film, all the things he'd 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 built up a career and were gone. I mean, he'd started in theatre in the thirties. He'd he'd been to Russia. He'd gone into film. He joined the Communist Party in 1946. So even though he left behind um, a lot of those problems in, in America when he came to the UK, he still wasn't completely in the clear. So the film uh, The Sleeping Tiger was actually made... Uh, he was he was sponsored to make that by uh, another a fellow American exile, Carl Foreman, who sort of took him under his wing and helped him. But he had to direct the film under the pseudonym Victor Hanbury... Who was an old-time director who just lent his name, rented his name out for the purpose, yeah. wasn't he? His career then did fairly well after that. I mean, he was making a film every year or 18 months or so. And you wanted to work with him, Wendy, but you said that there was a kind of depressing atmosphere on this set. Who generated that? Was that, was that Losey? No, I think it was a combination of everything. It was the script, it was the weather, it was the story and yes I mean to a certain extent Joe was very firm there was no larking about uh, it was a very quiet set you felt that if you were going to laugh or titter or anything at all with a bit of humour involved that you would be frowned upon did you get frowned upon yes <laughs> what did you do well, you see, I'm the sort of actor who likes to act, but I like to stop acting when I'm not acting. So when I come off the set, I stop acting because I think acting off the set is terribly insincere. <laughs> and um, I'm someone who likes to joke around and one of the things I always take on the set is a bag of sweets mm -hmm. and hand them round to the crew and the other actors and things like that. And Joe caught me doing this one day. He was furious with me and said, take those off the set. His voice was so cold and angry that I never did it again. But that wasn't Bogard's attitude to you, no. was it? He, look, he looked after you. In a way, I think he may have been the person who said, let's have her. Tell me about acting with him. Well, Dirk was very kind to me because I was really quite new to filming. I didn't know much about the technique or anything and Dirk was very kind to me. As you know, the leading actor has a caravan on the set and um, between takes and after we'd finished shooting, he'd invite a few people in and we'd sit and talk and anything I was worried about, I used to ask Dirk and Dirk would guide me. I mean, I was so ignorant of it all, that I remember Dirk telling me, we're going to turn round now, the camera's going to turn round, so we do the whole thing again, but the camera will be facing me and not you, all right? <laughs> and he really taught me the technique of filming, you know. And what did you make of the relationship between him and, and Joe Losey, because this was, I think, characterised by, I think in later years, Bogard um, said that each film that he made with him was an exhausting, was a bitter, exhausting battle. But there was 
a kind of cooper deep cooperation between these two men on this film, wasn't it? Not least because of Losey falling ill during the production. Well, the thing was that Dirk adored Joe. I got the feeling that he absolutely worshipped him and hung on his every word. So, yes, I mean, he, he, Joe was the boss, but then... Joe took ill. He was he wasn't a strong man. He he was, uh, I th I think he was an asthmatic, and then he got pneumonia, because we did some awful outdoor shooting in the cold, and had to go to hospital. Dirk used to go to the hospital every night and take notes from Joe, and he'd come back the next morning into the studio and give us all the notes. And then he would direct it as Joe wanted it to be done. But Mark, you brought with you a copy of the of the novella upon which Pinter based his script by, by Robin Maugham. What's your sense of the genealogy of what we hear on screen? How Pinteresque is that script? Or, you know, how Pinteresque is Robin Maugham's novel, novella? I think what's fascinating reading the novel is... You can go for 20 pages, nothing, 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 and then Pinter's eye alights on something really quite specific, even as specific as the tap dripping when uh, Sarah Miles' character and uh, Dope Bargaret's character are starting a, a more than a flirtation, a sort of intense passion. Uh, that's in the novel, the tap dripping, and then he'll glide over much broader details and the, the bunch of flowers being moved backwards and forwards is precisely described in the novel and precisely replicated in the film. Mm. I mean, I think the th main thing about the novel is it's very much a post-war novel. So it's really about... And there's quite a lot of their memories of, of, of being in the army together. Tony and our narrator, who we don't have in the film, yes. who's a sort of Watson to Tony's homes and is telling the tale, uh, they're war buddies. And I think the sense that, that come the end of the war they're going to fall into comfort and ease and lose all sense of who they are is really the driving force behind the whole novel. So in some ways, the driving force of, of the whole novel is sort of gone. But I, th there's some bits that really stand out at you and you sort of go, oh, that's really informed a sequence and almost some of the shots. And I, I thought I'd read just a little yeah. bit where in the novel, our narrator discovers something. The door was flung open and Barrett peered out of the brightly lit room. He stepped quietly onto the landing. His long, thin body was green and horrible in the moonlight. Then he saw me. Neither of us spoke. Into the stillness, the voice from the bedroom came like a blasphemy shrieked in chapel. There's no one there. I told you there wasn't. Come on back or you'll catch your death of cold. Come on, Hugo. If you come back now, you can... The hot words tumbled about my ears as I ran down the stairs and rushed out of the house. And the shots of Bogart's shadow on the wall and the stairs and the look and all of that's in the film. But actually, things have changed. They're in they're in the master's bedroom in the film. And actually, it's Wendy's character and Dirk's character who, who are there on at the bottom of the stairs where it's, it's our third person sort of outside narrator. But, you know, you can really see even in, in the cinematography and stuff how some of that's really still drawing very heavily on the novel and yet some of the context has changed. Even when in the film the, the post-war context is not emphasized, there's still a sense of these peoples are, are leftover people. They're, mm. they're sort of out of time and place. They're not with the time in a certain way and, and, and it's very much emphasized by the constant references to colonialism yes a country that used to be colonies That's, for now these are addition. these yeah. are very strange aren't they and they seem to be yeah. something that that they have a strong pinteresque vibe these characters have these slightly dodgy business <laughs> interests um in in very vague geographical spaces i mean what 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 is your take on those fung I think it's, it's very much an attack on the kind of um upper class british mentality who's still want to continue this their idea of belonging into the British Empire. But within the context when the film came out, so many countries in, in Africa and, and Asia were beginning to gain their their freedom from colonization. And also at the same time, only a month before the film came out, the Pufumo scandal um, exploded mm -hmm. in the press. And again, that also added the distrust to the, uh, to the upper class, to the um, political class, 
And all of that contributed to the atmosphere of paranoia that we see in the film. Is it a kind of State of England film as well, Joe? Yeah, very much so. I mean, of course, as Mark pointed out, it was set in the post-war period, but Tony was even more of an anachronism by 1963 than he had been then. And, of course, as Fung pointed out very accurately, that the whole Profumo affair was unfolding actually during the shooting. It was actually shot from January to March in 1963, and that was exactly the period that the whole Profumo affair was unfolding. And then, of course, culminating with the government, with the, the Prime Minister resigning the, the month before it was released. Class is such a hot subject in this period, isn't it, Wendy? Oh, very the much early so. 60s. What, what, I mean, what do you think the servants take on all of that is? I think it was all happening in a big way at that time. I, I, I think um, the working classes were, were rising up, as it were, and um, definitely the, the rich people and, and the people who had big houses and... Uh, they were losing their properties, they, they had terrible taxes, they were losing their great houses. And, uh, yeah, it, it was all happening at that time. Was it happening to Susan? I mean, what were your thoughts about what Susan's class background was, if I can I put don't it like think, that? Uh, I don't think it was happening to Susan because I don't think she was quite as upper class as that. Mm. I think they probably had... Her parents had a lovely house in Hampstead or something. <laughs> but um, I'm not sure about that house we went to, that, that very posh house with a lovely garden and we rolled about in the snow. It's a kind of weekend I never was quite away. sure who those people were, <laughs> Richard Vernon and the, the various people. Um, I, I, I wasn't quite sure whether when, they were relatives who'd invited us or what. It is a bit mysterious, isn't it? Yeah. Because they go, yes. for, go away for the weekend with these two friends. Tony and Susan go away for the weekend and they seem to be going for a weekend in an Antonioni film. Yeah, it's yeah. extraordinary. Yes. Wendy, I wanted to ask you, as we've gone to the country house, there's this amazing shot sequence where you're all in these extraordinary poses. I know. Um, and I wondered how you found those. We, was there a sketch where you literally manhandled, where you said, can you offer me something? Which Can you remember no. how that came about? No, Joe just said, stand there and look out of that window and be quite still. And Because um... your whole body, you're sort of like a, a model, your whole body's sort of curved and twisted and, and you must have been like that for hours. I was. Been, yes. I was like that for hours, yes. And I often thought, what am I doing? But because, as I say, the master was telling us what to do and I just did it. I didn't question it. Well, actually, I was scared I might get the sack. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the thing I love about that scene is the dialogue as well, where, where they're clearly <laughs> describing gauchos and calling them ponchos. And oh, it's, yes. It's, yeah. but, but actually... It's nonsense, That's yeah, really, aren't but, they? Yeah. But there are several scenes that... The original cut of the film was two hours and 20 minutes and there were quite a lot of these little oh, vignette mm. scenes, uh, as, which is how they described them. Uh, there was a scene of... Barrett's character going to his digs with a landlady and there are a couple of other scenes like this but they all ended up on the cutting room floor which is a was obviously very upsetting to to Losi because they were they, they were a, they were to do with creating atmosphere mm. and clearly that the, the scene at the mound sets country home it's all about the atmosphere of, of the look of it the aesthetics and how that creates an atmosphere do we know what happened that's just lost to lost forever that footage is you it you never know as an archivist <laughs> we always hope one day these things will turn up but uh, they would be wonderful to see i want us to to listen to a scene which did survive one of the key scenes in the in the film one of my favorites a two-hander between dope bogard and wendy now at this point in the story susan is deeply suspicious of Barrett and the gloves have come off really in their uh, in their conflict. A vase of flowers has been the battleground of this argument, and some cushions. So in this scene, we hear a bit of those cushions, and we also hear some good pinter pauses. I want some lunch. A salad will do. Use the tarragon I bought on Wednesday. Yes. Light. Put that coat down and give me a light. Barrett, come here. Do you use a deodorant? 
Tell me, do you think you'd go well with a colour scheme? I think the master's satisfied. I think that's such a wonderful scene, Wendy. The way that the, the way that you the way that you put Barrett down, and the way that Bogard just stares at you in silence. You can almost see him quaking internally as you kind of force him to submit to you. I mean, do you remember filming the scene? Oh, very clearly. Yes, I agree with you. I mean, I mean it was amazing to watch Dirk quaking slightly and trying to think what he's going to do to this woman when he gets his chance. Rip down the spice rack she's put up in the kitchen yes. is the top of his list, I think. Yes, absolutely. But, but was it as intense on the set as it appears to us whilst watching it? It was, it was. It was one long take. Well, I was used to doing long scenes because I'd worked in the theatre so much. Um, so I was used to that. But I think Dirk was quite amazed that I could actually carry a, a long scene like that. Four minutes, I think it was, from beginning to end, which is nothing on the stage, is it? Let's face it. I want to make space to say something about that line about the deodorant. Mm. Yes, I thought when I read it and, and rehearsed it, I thought, this'll get him. This is the stab that will get him. He will feel like a horrible little squirt. <laughs> and a dirty one at that. Fung, in a way, I think that line about the deodorant is one of the most important in the film because, because Barrett's cleanness and or dirtiness seem to be at the heart of the story in some way. I have to say that that was also very much present in the novella. Um, there's a lot of references to, I mean, when Susan character is named Sally in, in the novella, and um, she also talk about unclean uncleanliness, and and Tony talk about getting to the country, so he can feel clean, compared to dirty London, and this sort of obsession obsession with um, being hygienic, I think is very much again associated with class. Mm. Um, Bogart character Barrett. One to be clean, one to be um, sort of belong, one to trump over Tony character and, and cleaning it plays a part in that. But I think it's also playing to this idea of the city as being dirty as well. And I think Not particularly really Chelsea, which I don't associate yes. it with anymore yes. now, but in those Kenneth Horn sketches, it was as I was looking through a copy of The Men's Physique recently, I read it for the recipes, and I noticed there was a new organisation called Boner Books, so I made my way to Chelsea and knocked and entered. He always goes to Chelsea, so in the 60s, there must be it must be sort of associated as seemingly to be a bit grand and a bit posh, but underneath, all a bit dirty and queer and sexy and... Well, violence too, isn't it? The Chelsea smile and Chelsea boots. Mm, all Chelsea that. boots, yeah. yeah, yeah. Was, I mean, it's now quite settled as just being posh, I think, but it obviously <laughs> was sort of on the edge in the 60s. Let's introduce a, a new character to this story, an important one who we haven't talked about yet, uh, Vera, played by Sarah Miles, who is presented as Barrett's sister um, and is this rather childlike young woman who eats chocolate bars in the taxi on the way to the house in Chelsea and giggles a lot, but is also the focus of intense sexual um, interest. Let's describe her, Joe. Tell us about that character. So, yes, I mean, she's summoned by, by Barrett uh, on the telephone and a, a lovely little, another little vignette where he goes to, to the phone box to, to ring Bolton to, uh, and, and she arrives at, at, the, at the station and he, as you say, behaving like an excited child to be in the big city. But she obviously reveals a, a very different side as, as the story unfolds and the character of Vera was 16 in the novella. Clearly she's not in the film. So the, the perversion which he's being offered is not quite as extreme uh, in the character of of Vera. But she she sort of she stays at the house for a while and then just sort of becomes the maid, which is obviously all part of Barrett's grand plan to infiltrate the house um, and take over from within. 
And this Wendy is such a sophisticated performance by Sarah Miles. There's so much, so much to observe in it. What did you make of it? I was enchanted by it. I just had to watch her filming. I think she caught her perfectly. The awful vulgarity and sexiness and the desire to lead this young man on to please Barrett. What fun. What a wicked thing to do, but, oh, what fun. <laughs> Mark? And she does some... I mean, I think everybody does these incredible sort of almost dance-like things at moments, but there's a point where she climbs onto the table and swings around, and it's like a sort of... It's almost sort of Pina Bausch-y sort of, sort of dance moment. And, I mean, I think Joseph Losey... He sounds like he was a tough taskmaster, but he does get access to these incredibly brave choices. It just sort of go, whoa, we've sort of headed into sort of stylistic dance sort of stuff now. But, you know, you feel Sarah Miles is a very good game for being doing all those bold sort of naughty things. There's a deception going on in this household and at, at a key point in the story, it is discovered and there and Tony and Barrett go their separate ways. Barrett gets sacked by Tony. But then they're reunited. They find themselves in a pub together and they sort of, in a strange kind of way, settle their differences and agree to move back in together. And then suddenly we see them back at home and the relationship seems to have totally transformed. Let's have the clip. You're still sitting there. What's this? It's waxed, so we'll soon wane. Five letters. I haven't got time for all that. Well, you ask me soon enough when you want some help. Look at all this muck and slime. It makes you, it makes you feel sick. Well, do something about it. You're supposed to be the bloody servant. You expect me to cope with all this muck and filth everywhere? All your leavings all over the place without a maid, do you? I need a maid to give me help and hand. I'm not used to working in such squalor. And what I've got in my hands, you. Can't expect to get any work done in this place at all. As soon as I get the Uber going, you're straight up it. You're in everybody's way. Oh, why don't you leave me alone? It's this, it's waxed, so we'll wane soon. Five letters. But why don't you get yourself a job instead of mooning about the house all the time? Oh, I can't. Think. Here I am, scraping and skimping, trying to make ends meet, getting worse and worse. And you're no bloody help either. Do you know that butter's gone up tuppence a pound? As a matter of fact, I'll be meeting a man very shortly. <laughs> what man? The man from Brazil? What's he going to do for you? Come down by helicopter on the roof, is that it? Oh, why don't you shut up? But he sounds like an old fishwife. <laughs> he really does. What it reminds me of is the um, Orton and Halliwell relationship in the film of, of Prick Up Your Ears, these two sort of queens... Uh, fighting against each other. I mean, it's just sort of reported in the in, in the novella. They they have the same reunion, but it just says, um, the screen of convention which stood between them and him and Barrett had been shattered. There was an easy understanding the barriers were down. They were no longer master and servant. So it's just sort of reported like that in the book, but then he embodies it in that dialogue so brilliantly and funnily and painfully, doesn't he? Fung, this has an extraordinary temperature, this scene doesn't it? We're, we're back in what seems to be a kind of version of the marital home. Yeah, I, I really love that scene. And my reading of it is very much just in the same way that the servants signify a pivotal to move for Bro Bogart to, from, be, from a British matinee idol to a kind of European art house household name. That scene is, is also putting a little bit of like the British kitchen sink mm -hmm fight realism into what's very much a kind of European art house kind of movie as well. So in that sense, it's almost like Losey is consciously parodying not only heterosexuality, but also a kind of very sort of idea of British cinema as well, I think. This is Free Thinking on BBC Radio 3 and BBC Sounds with me, Matthew Sweet. Our duties on this programme include examining Joseph Losey's 1963 film The Servant and its star, Dirk Bogard, who would have been 100 this year. And performing those duties are Fung Lei, Joe Botting, Mark Ravenhill and one of the stars of The Servant, Wendy Craig. Wendy, do you remember how the film was received? I think it was received very well in artistic circles. 
I got a lot of people coming up to me and saying, oh, we did enjoy it, it was uh, very strange and uh, we were fascinated by it and and you were an absolute cow in it. <laughs> uh, and But I I don't know. I, I, did the public go to it? I don't know. Joe. Well, the, the the British critics absolutely loved it. This finally, some of them said, a, a British film that 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 does more than tell a story. You know, it's got so many layers of sound editing. You know, the way that Pinter used dialogue, like sound effects, the visual aspects of it. They they just they all went to see it at least twice, I think, because they they do there was so much in there. And Losi had helped it along by you know usually the press office would would send out a bog standard synopsis of a film. And Losi said this is not a film that wants a synopsis, and he wrote a very long treatise about mm. why he made the film and and what he what he wanted to do with it and how he saw cinema. So it really this was his the first film that he'd really had a massive investment personally in. But I'd really love to read you a letter from the Sunday Telegraph, if I may, <laughs> which uh, refers to the fact that the, the film has been hailed by our universally pinko critics as brilliant. What disturbed one most in watching the film was the reaction of the audience, smirking and chortling at the portrayal of an English gentleman brought low by his servant. There was a total lack of indignation at the covert communist propaganda. How the critics would have whimpered with rage if the degradation had been imposed on the servant by his master. So... Wow, is this the sort of film you would wish your servants to watch? Well, oh, yes. <laughs> if you still have any, of course, by 1960. You know, because I think from now, watching it, I thought I really... You could, you could read this film either way. You could read it from quite a, a right-wing perspective, really. I was thinking about Christopher Booker in his book The Neophiliacs, where he writes about this period, and he, he sort of takes, you know, this is where the rock really really sets in around about 1963. But I think if you had that opinion, I think you could watch this mm. film and said, see, I was right, that is when the rot sets in. Because he's a kind of monster, isn't he? Yeah, you've, you know, you've, the barriers are starting to fall down and it all goes, it all goes wrong. Joe, the BFI is the home of the, the Losey archive and you've brought in a few documents uh, for us. He was very good at keeping up with cast and crew. Yeah, as I said, this was a really, really personal project for Losi and he was invested in every single aspect of it and he wrote copious letters to almost everyone involved in the production after the film and his collection is full of these letters, praising his crew, his cast. He wrote uh, to Wendy uh, and actually he apologised to you, Wendy, for for being quite hard to work with on set in, and he did that in a couple of the letters. He wrote to James Fox, to Sarah Miles, he wrote to everybody... He wrote to the to Douglas Slocum. He wrote to Chick the cinematographer. Ma yeah, he wrote to Chick Masterson, who was the camera operator. Everyone, all the way down, uh, you know, the list of, of credits. He also wrote to Humphreys Film Laboratories, thanking them for the beautiful prints that they'd made, and they responded saying, "We loved working on your film because it made us feel like technicians rather than than workmen." So th there was a lot of investment in terms of time and and love almost in this film from everyone involved. I want to, as, as we as we draw towards a, a close here, I re really want to pull focus on Dope Bogard himself. This is his centenary year. He's a star who means so much to, to many people. What is his trajectory after The Servant, Joe? And why is that important? Why should we know about that? He'd finished at rank by that point and he was he was finally making the films that he really wanted to make. And he was he, he'd always wanted to be an art house actor. Um, and I think the most important thing for him was having a close relationship with a director who he felt had something to say. So he worked with Losi several times subsequently. They, they built up quite a close working relationship over several films. But then Losi sort of moved away and started working with Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor. And I think, but I think Bogard felt quite betrayed by this. In fact, this little, this little coming together here of Pinter, Bogard and Losi was something that was never really to, to be repeated in the same way. And I think they, they all moved on and went different ways. Bogard obviously became the darling of, of European cinema yeah. uh, into the 70s. And, and I think he, he just he found a lot more personal satisfaction in, in that way. The idea of satisfaction, though, I think attends Bogart. And I wonder whether he ever really found satisfaction. That, that I mean, certainly for me, watching films from this part of his career, it's the idea that all of this good stuff has come to him slightly too late. 
that makes it so rich and so full of, of meaning. There's also that undercurrent of violence and sadism in Bogard's performances of this period, a hint of vanity as well. I think he works with all these hot young directors, you know, he works with uh, Fassbinder and Visconti, he makes Death in Venice, he makes Fox and his friends. And I love the way he sort of abandons his dignity in this period. He kind of goes wild in a way, Mark. <laughs> well, I think that image of... Uh... It's come. To, it's all come too late. You know, you really feel that in the in the death in Venice and just that final scene of all the makeup running. You know, which one of the, must be one of the most images from cinema that most sears itself into your brain. And that sense of he's just looking on at the rest of the world, still wanting, but he can't do it anymore. And the makeup's running. I mean, that's that's very powerful. But I think he still remained. We talk about Art House Dirk, but I think he still remained a popular figure. I remember by my mum's bed, who had never been to an art house film, she had Dirk Bogart's biography. So I think a lot of the nation still, certainly women of my mother's age, still had a big old crush on Dirk Bogart well into the 70s and 80s. Fung, what does what does the late Bogart, or he's re it's really the middle and late Bogart, mean for you? I have to say that that was my entrance into becoming a Dirk Bogart aficionado. Um, definitely um, not so late, but victim and, and the servant. And it's interesting when I read about how um, after he made victim, he sort of, his fan mail letter kind of dwindled. And it doesn't have to do with the fact that he played a homosexual man in victim. It had to do with the fact that fan can really discern his wrinkles and his gray hair. And that's what disturbed him more. Wendy, what did you, what do you, make of him did you keep in touch with him did you did you follow his films i think as an actor you're always glad to be working and i think that dirk achieved everything that an actor could want to achieve he played every kind of part dr sparrow and all those comedy roles then he did the servant and accident and then as you say he went on to do all these continental films i don't think he's got anything to grumble about and i don't think we have anything to criticize i mean i just think he did his job properly and in many different ways but that sort of there is a kind of restlessness about his screen persona isn't there there's something that, that burns in him that I feel I can see on the screen. It sounds like he was saving it for the camera because it sounds like to work with, he was incredibly generous and calm. You didn't feel like actually when you were working with him that sort of sense of frustration and restlessness, which... Not at all. But, so he, he obviously saved think, it for the camera. I think he was ambitious. I think he wanted to be the Laurence Olivier of the cinema, but then... We all set out to be the best at what we can do. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think it was eating him away exactly. I went um, to see him because he, he had a stroke, you know, and uh, I, I went to, to his house and um, he was quite pleased to see me, but I, I don't think he wanted me to stay. You know, he, I think he was embarrassed about not being well and not being how he was and so I left quite soon and that was the last time you saw him mm. and there we have to stop my thanks to Fung Lei, to Joe Botting to Mark Ravenhill and particularly to Wendy Craig who you can see sharp and clear in a new restored version of The Servant that's now in selected cinemas and out on Blu-ray and if you hunger for more Dirk, then the imminent BFI season may satisfy you. Well, maybe. Not quite, because that work, I suspect, raises desires that can never be satisfied. That was Matthew Sweet, and tomorrow's topic for free thinking is punk. Our next opera on three is a rare chance to hear Tippett's opera The Midsummer Marriage. Modelled on Mozart's The Magic Flute, it's one of his most joyful and sensuous works. There's a brilliant cast led by Robert Murray and the London Philharmonic Orchestra will be conducted by Edward Gardner. The Midsummer Marriage comes live from London's Southbank Centre on Saturday evening at 6.30.
This is After Dark on BBC Radio 3. Political and protest songs of the 40s and 50s formed a backdrop to the then social and political struggles of Bengal. Now in the essay, Amit Chaudhry tells how these songs shaped the society in which he was to grow up. It was 1994 or 1995. I can't recall the exact year, but I date my memory by looking up the general agreement on tariffs and trade, or the GATT treaty, and when India signed it. GATT was an agreement between the nations of the world to do away with trade barriers that protected domestic industries and markets from the effects of free international trade. Around 1994, India finally signed GATT, and protective bastions crumbled with the onslaught of capitalism. This moment was crucial to laying the foundations of globalization, that is, of the world we have been living in for the last 30 years. The Berlin Wall had already fallen and the Soviet Union had disintegrated in 1991, the year that India too, to rescue itself from bankruptcy, opted for economic deregulation. Few recall how trade barriers came crashing down soon after with the signing of GATT. I was in Britain at the time, but as was my habit, escaped to India whenever I could. In Britain, people were in the midst of irrevocable changes they couldn't properly make sense of and still haven't entirely grasped today. The age had created Margaret Thatcher in so many of her features, including her speech and appearance and invention and it was reinventing the Labour Party. The heir to Thatcher, Tony Blair, was waiting in the wings and, ironically, on the opposition benches. In the winter of 1994, I was spending time in Calcutta, to which my parents had moved from Bombay after my father's retirement. I had been married for three years and my wife and I were here to get away from the dullness and melancholy of Christmas in Oxford. A few times a week I visited my uncle's house where I had spent summers as a child. Two of my three cousins were in America, but the oldest of the siblings among my uncle's children was in Calcutta. He had joined the Communist Party. The Communist Party of India split into two in 1964. Its breakaway offshoot, the Communist Party of India, Marxist, becoming, then, socialism's main political face in the country. By 1994, it had been in power in the state of West Bengal, of which Calcutta was the capital, for 17 years, exactly midway through its career 